Ashford Castle, but this is really the castle section, 1850s, uh, 1870s, sorry, all native limestone quarried here on the estate. That is probably a part of the moat that went with the original Norman castle. Wow. So we quickly make our way up front to stage two. I don't want to confuse you. So by 1715, Lord Orne Moran Brown has the wealth and the power and he wants to show his wealth and importance and he builds Ashford House where we were sitting where we were talking to you a few moments ago. Yeah. So when did you arrive? When did you arrive? Yesterday. You, you're, you're yesterday you just came. You're, you're, you're doing a trip all around Ireland or are you just coming? We went to the north so we started at the Giant's Causeway. Oh yes. And yes. then came here and then we'll return to Dublin tomorrow. Oh, so that's quick. Enough. Just doing a mini tour. Right. Yeah. My daughter is working from home so. Oh yes. She's so much. Wow this is a great view. This is the view that you would have been arriving to, as I said, in the Guinness's time, you know. Wow. So it is. Yeah, this is where you would have been arriving. In the Spectacular and imposing. So as we come up along... Thank you. That's the Guinness crest there on the corner. You oh, see it in lots yes. of places inside as well. Is that know. a griffin? It's two stags. Oh, two stags. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. And the coat of arms. I'll have to look up closer. That three arch window is the Kennedy Suite. And the next three arch window up is the Reagan Street. That was the ground floor. So our floor. presidents. Yes. Okay. Were, um, uh, in the Guinness's time, that was their family quarters. Beautiful. And like the Queen Victoria, the Guinnesses would only ever sleep on the ground floor. Oh. Because you see, you must remember in these buildings. <laughs> excuse me. God bless. Pre, um, when you in all, when you had all log fires and candles, fire is a ferocious hazard. Sure. Bless you. A ferocious hazard. So. I'm sleeping on the ground floor and the rest so of you can get out. Yeah, yeah, can take your chances up there. So, by 1715, he has the wealth and the power, and Lord Orne Moran Brown builds Ashford House, freestanding house, right in front of us, starting at the drain pipe up to my right. You're now only seeing two thirds of it, because again, do you see that speckled piece in the corner, 1970s? They're built on top of a third of Ashford House, the dining room, and out in front of it. And as you can see, very much built in the style of a French chateau. Mm -hmm. Because by the 1700s, everything French is very much in style all over Europe. The Golden Eagle on top there is still the crest of Lord Orne Moran Brown and his family. And when we go inside, architecturally brilliant, this is the most significant piece of Ashford inside. This is it outside. We're going to find a long, narrow building that has no hallways. You simply go straight through from room to room. And every second room, big room and small room, we'll come to that in a moment. So, <coughs> 1700s, golden era for the landowning class. The wealth is pouring in. They abandon Ireland. The famine destroys them into the Guinnesses. And this is their, this is their creation, 1870s, as I said, all native limestone. And this tower here in front of me with the flagpoles, that's from the Guinness era as well. And there was a low single story piece going in from that tower that joined onto the house but that was wiped out by the 1970s ah. building. Gardeners were brought in by the, I don't know, have you been down? Well, you might you find a chance in the afternoon. Uh, gardeners were brought in to lay down the terraced gardens in the style of the uh, lovely uh, Victorian gardens. Wow. And through the 1870s here, Arthur Guinness has 400 staff and he's spending a fortune developing this estate and he's spending another fortune entertaining high society Britain and in 1880 it all pays off Queen Victoria raises him to the House of Lords she doesn't uh, mention uh, the grubby matter of all the money he has donated to the Conservative Party uh, he becomes they get their title from a little island. Well, everyone thought he was going to become Lord Ashford, mm -hmm. but the Ashford title was already gone, some guy in Kent. Mm -hmm. So they get their title from a little island around the corner out here called Ardalon, A-R-D-I-L-A-U-A. He becomes Lord Ardalon, she becomes Lady Ardalon. The Guinnesses have arrived at title after three or four generations. It has cost a fortune, but as far as they're concerned, well, a lot of these families bankrupted themselves wow. in the quest for title. So while Arthur has achieved title, his brother Edward has gone on to accumulate the wealth that most of the Guinnesses still live on today. Yeah. By the end of the 1800s, he has expanded the brewery into Britain, Europe, North America. 
only have 50% at this time? Or does yeah, he oh, no, he has bought out half, but I know he has 100%. Uh -huh. okay. He bought out half. Because I didn't know he had 50% already. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 Arthur yeah. was the oldest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Arthur right. is the oldest, but he has 100%. And he has turned it into a massive empire. Edward has. Edward now. has. Right. And uh, he is. But he then floats 49% of it on the British stock market, uh, which made him a multi-billionaire. Wow. He then diversified into banking, Guinness Mahan Bank, stockbroking and property all over the world, which most of the Guinnesses still live on today. They don't live on the brewery. The brewery is largely gone from, they own less than 2% of Diageo. Wow. They haven't had a seat on the board for, I would say, 30 years. They largely blew the brewery. But yeah. most of them, some of them are destitute. Some of them are very wealthy, but basically they're living off the wealth that the fort this guy accu uh, accumulated. And Thanks. he became so important and powerful. He sailed the seven seas with Queen Victoria and her family in his fabulous yachts. He partied regularly in Buckingham Palace with the royals. And not surprising, Victoria raised him to the House of Lords. He becomes Lord Ivy, I-V-E-A-G-H, Ivy House, yep. Stephen's Green Department of Foreign Affairs. And uh, he went a step higher, he became Earl Ivy. Ah. And in recognition of his power and importance, Queen Victoria spent a full week with the Guinnesses in Dublin for the horse show in 1900. And that's the ultimate recognition. Yes. And then... At Ivy House? At Ivy House and St. Anne's Rohini, their country estate, and Farm Lee in the Phoenix Park, oh, and right. Leap Castle. So she didn't need to be bored by the decor. They had any, <laughs> amount of places to, any amount of places to entertain her. And while she's with the Guinnesses, as another favour, she decides that her son Edward, Prince of Wales, will come to Ashford to shoot with the Guinnesses. But then a bit of bad luck, Victoria dies in 1901, Edward rises to the throne, Edward VII, he can't come busy. He sends his son George, Prince of Wales, to shoot with them here in 1905. Great and that's news. the one that became King George after his the brother George abdicated. The George, the, exactly. Okay. The, 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 yeah. No, George VI isn't it that came after him. Okay, so George, that was the, his the uncle. The King's speech. The yes. King's speech. This George is the grandfather of Elizabeth II. Thank you. And he's also the guy who changed the family name from Hanover to Windsor after World War One. Married yeah. to Mary. Yes. Yes, yeah, okay. Mary, Mary um, I can't think of her name again. He was one of the more sober-minded royals, anyhow, was George the Victorian. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, so... George came here for a week's shooting in 1905 and the Guinness has spent an absolute fortune preparing for the coming of George. First item, a new entrance. You know that tower entrance out at the road, built specifically for the coming of George, Beautiful. facing the Ballon Robe Road where the carriage would come from. A new ro road through what is now the golf course. Yes. With the ulterior motive, without that entrance, the royal carriage would have had to have come through the village mm. and they didn't want that because by 1905, the natives, the Irish natives, are not that appreciative of British royalty, so they could have been shouting obscenities or throwing objects. So they cordoned off the village, and George came in here well away from the, the peasants. They added the bar down here, I'll show you in a minute, the Prince of Wales cocktail lounge for the coming of George. And the main dining room, which is in the middle of that building now, went on to become the George V, because as you said, he rose to the throne, I think around yes. 1910. So, George came for a week shooting, but better news still, shooting is very good. He stayed for three weeks. Wow. And this is wonderful. And after this, the Guinnesses have queues of British aristocrats begging to come here to shoot with them. And they love it. And they turn the Ashford shoot into a high society exclusive event. Mm -hmm. And they will invite seven titled families to shoot here at the beginning of December every year. Seven more at the end of January. And if you can get on that list, you've made it. The Guinness shoot in Ashford. You'll reciprocate now with a little sailing in the Caribbean, skiing in Italy. They don't work, you see. And now World War I is approaching and we're going to kill off a lot of the workforce in Europe and labour is going to become scarce and expensive and these estates are going to become financially unviable for most people. Not the Guinnesses, it doesn't matter. They can subsidise it. So, the coming of George cost the Guinnesses another fortune but it put Ashford on the circuit and it was well worth it again, as far as they were concerned. Arthur, Lord Ardalon, our guy here, died in Dublin 1915, age 74, and now the arranged marriage comes back to Holland. It was a financial arrangement. They led very separate lives. They come together for great ceremonial occasions, keeping up the appearance that there's no family, there's no heir. Disaster. Ah. And after all the trouble and expense of getting that Ardalon title, it's now down the ground with them. And worst news still... It didn't go to a nephew? No, the title goes through the male line. Hmm. No family, 
And worse news still for her, she's not Guinness. So she's disinherited, which was quite legal in Ireland up to 1966. Wow. They didn't throw her out on the road. She's allowed to leave her final 10 years in, I think, in Ivy House. Um, she's out of Ashford. And in 1915, Ashford passes to his charming brother, Edward Earl Ivy, the guy with all the money. And the 400 staff here believe, they rightly believe, that guy has no interest in Ashford. He'll just sell, take the money and run. We're all unemployed. And he would have only for World War One. He didn't need money. But by 1915, thankfully for Ashford, he needed fishing and shooting. Because being the loyal British subject he was, he donated his huge country estate in Suffolk to the British military for World War I. That's where they developed the tank and did all the training and preparation for trench warfare. So his fishing and shooting was destroyed in Suffolk in Elverdon. And he came to Ashford for the duration of the war, or most of it. And he expanded the estate from 12 to 25,000 acres because after the war there were financially ruined landowners all over the place and being the nice guy he was he rescued them all. <laughs> he continued to come here every year. He died in 1927. Mm. No inheritance problem. He has three sons married to his own second cousin. The eldest son Rupert by right became the second Lord Ivy and MD of the brewery and that's the beginning of the decline. Rupert didn't like Dublin. Brewery is disgusting. He rarely bothered with board meetings or anything like that. The youngest of the three boys, Walter Guinness, great friend of the Churchills, he went on to become the first Lord Moyne, M-O-I-N-E. -E. They huh. still have the Moyne and Ivy title. And in 1927, Ashford passed to the middle of the three sons who lived in Dublin, Ernest Guinness. Now, Ernest had a very simple view of the world. Work is for the little people. And we party. And boy, does he party. And to help him with the partying, he's got three daughters. They're called the Golden Guinness Girls, a recent book published on them. Oh, They're the them. modern day Kardashians. Oh no. <laughs> and Ernest flies in here on his aqua plane in the 1940s and he has power boats and sports cars and anything money can buy and wild and lavish parties all over the world. And the girls go on to accumulate eight husbands. And the marriages are lavish affairs and the divorces are mega expensive and the lawyers are having a field day. And Ernest's answer is, where's the party? Let the next guy fix it. But he continues to come to Ashford every year for the shoot. Great for the status of the family, great for the local economy. But by now, 1930s, tenants out here totally hostile. Staff, who used to be very loyal to the Guinnesses, realise that this guy is not for real. So every December, <coughs> when Ernest arrives into Ashford with his shooting party to be impressed, what do the staff do? They go on strike. Why not? They realise he can't be embarrassed after invites so up. He just pays up. And that ritual continues every December until December of 1938. They're on strike again and they're expecting the usual payout. But this time Ernest throws a tantrum and he says, you know what? To hell with this goddamn place. It's just a pain. I'm not suffering anymore. Get me an estate agent. Consternation. Yeah. He put the place for sale in January of 1939. What a time. And not surprising, there were no buyers. So he donated the whole damn lot to the Irish state for the miserable sum of £20,000. Wow. The state still has 10,000 acres of the forest out there. They have destroyed it with conifers. 10,000 acres of the land was then divided up among the tenantry on a lease to purchase scheme. That's essentially how we got back the land that had been confiscated by de Burgo. It took us about 700 years, but we got there. Wow. And that means in 1939, after Ashford Castle and the present estate, about 300 acres, empty, heading for virtual certain ruin and dereliction. But in July of 1939, a hotelier from County Kerry by the name of Noel Hugger leases it from the Irish government and he opens his hotel here and everyone has a laugh at him. What an idiot. War in Europe, coming to Europe, this guy opening a hotel, idiotic. But the war is the godsend. We are neutral in World War Two. Mm -hmm. Big farm here, plenty of beef, vegetables, dairy products. Britain bombarded, food rationed. A lot of the landowning class that had fled from Ireland to Britain in the previous generation or two now decided, oh, let's get the hell out of here. We'll go back to Ireland. You know that little place in Kong, no war, where the Guinnesses used to live. Nice little hotel. Let's check in there. Noel Huggard has five years of boom business during the war and they continue to come after the war and bring their friends and neighbours, they like the fishing and the shooting. He retires 
He runs a very successful party bedroom, family run hotel, retires in 72, sells on to a wealthy Irish American by the name of John A. Mulcahy, friend of Richard Nixon. And Mulcahy is the guy who builds all this second section all the way down to the river. He added 52 bedrooms to bring it to his present 82. He changed the deer park out there into a golf course. And above all, he changed the whole focus of marketing from Britain to the States. He had to, because by the 1970s, we were killing one another in Northern Ireland over mm -hmm. religion. Um, Mulcahy runs a very successful international hotel into the middle of the 1990s. He gets into financial difficulties. He sells on to a consortium of Irish and American people, business people, 40 of them. They destroyed the place. They sold timeshares. They in turn sold on to a property speculator during the Celtic Tiger. Are you familiar with or we had a great property boom in the noughties. He just mortgaged the place to the tune of 75 million and then the crash came after Lehman Brothers and it went into liquidation again and it got lucky again into the present owners, the Tollman family, South African Red Carnation Group. They bought it for a bargain, reputedly 20 million. The debt on it was 75 million. They had it spent over 70 million to refurbish it and they bought back the sister hotel, the lodge. The lodge was the estate manager's house in the Guinness's time. Looks down at the harbour where they kept the fabulous yachts and that. So we'll make our way and we'll head for that door.